We have an Earth-directed solar storm, and along with some fast solar wind, it could give us the best chance of aurora we've seen in a while. And big flares are back with the beginning of another Rosby surge. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash SWEN. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week has picked up in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, I want you to keep your eyes on region 4165 and 4168. You see it right here. These were the regions that during my last forecast, I said keep an eye on these because they're growing quite quickly. Well, sure enough, on the 5th, you could see what 4168, pow, right there, fires off a big M4.4 class flare. And as you saw that bit of an evacuation there, also launched an Earth-directed solar storm. We were smack dab in the Earth strike zone, so we're expecting this to hit Earth. However, before I talk about the details of this very interesting solar storm, to say the least, let me first point out we have this big coronal hole here. We've seen this one before, but this is actually playing a role in the dynamics of this solar storm, and we'll talk about that. We do have fast solar wind that's going to be hitting us from this coronal hole in a bit. It also has a bit of a boundary right here. I think that also plays a role in how this solar storm was actually launched. This fast solar wind might also deflect this solar storm just slightly to the west and possibly to the north as well. So let's pay closer attention to that. As we take a look at the actual incident itself, you can see some really gorgeous post-eruptive arcades, which means we actually had a solar slinky kind of launching horizontally like that. This is a very complex event. But it grew quite quickly. In fact, 4168 was only about 48 hours old by the time it finally fired that big uh, M4.4 class flare. So it was very interesting. Now, also, as we take a look at the coronal wave, watch this. Remember, we have that coronal hole. You can't see it right here because these are base difference images, but you can see that where that the set of regions is. And then as that uh, big flare fires, you can watch this coronal wave. Look at this blast, right? So this, the actual active region is right here, but this blast wave is almost completely to the west. You're seeing almost like a barrier right here, not really going much past it. In fact, you can see a little bit of evacuation in here, but there's just not much that propagates this way. As a matter of fact, it just continues to go off this side, but just will not go past this. Well, that's actually this barrier right here. So that actually kind of stopped this uh, big blast from actually loosening more material off on the west side of that, which actually then gives us a very interesting uh, perspective in coronagraphs, because when we look at the coronagraph signature, Look, it's not even a halo. It looks like you can see a little bit down here. Let me back up just a smidge. You can actually see just a little bit down in here. So it's a partial halo, but oh my goodness, if you weren't paying attention of where this actually was on the Earth-facing disk, you'd think that this thing would completely miss us. But let's take a closer look at this for a second. Is this thing going to go completely west of Earth, as some people believe, or is there more to it than that? So as we blow this up and take a look at 193, look how dynamic this event is. Here is the first bit of evacuation in our close-up, and of course this is the M4.4 class flare. But what's this over here? It looks like maybe another such another set of flares right here. Watch this. Look at it light up right there. And then look. So that's number two. And now look down here. Number three. So there are actually three flares and one. And as these multiple flares kind of lifted off, they kind of really created a complex looking structure that if we looked at it more deeply in chronographs, you can see this very convoluted kind of structure. I believe that's what made this thing so interesting. Between that and that barrier where that coronal hole is, you can see the bottom of it right there. That really makes things very difficult. So I have to commend to, uh, both Swipsy and, uh, you know, 
uh, NOAA or NOAA and NASA because they did such a great job in modeling these events uh, with all this complexity. Now, let's also take a look because I was noticing in here there was a little bit of material floating around. So let's take a look. Let's blend bo uh, both 193 and 304 angstroms so that we can look at this material. So you'll see this gorgeous set of material that falls out like this. But look what happens. Look at some of it kind of peeling back. Do you see some of that? Well, that's telling us that something else, and especially when this second flare lift, you know, really started brightening, something else evacuated and opened up, and this whole structure kind of started changing, I want to say changing direction, but kind of lifted off this way. So let's take a look in 304 angstroms, and that's the hardest one to see all this material in. Here we go. Let's see if I can actually point it out to you. So you can see the first. You can't really see the evacuation all that well, not in this wavelength. But you see a lot of the material. See all this brim, hot brimstone, <laughs> hot fire and lava, right? But watch this. Do you see this material here? Watch how it kind of actually even goes past. Look at it. Look. Look at it flying past. Do you see it flying up past the active region? So it's going, whatever this is, is going up and out. And if you watch this here, you can even see material here going up and out. So if you look really closely, it definitely looks like there is material that's going up and out. It isn't just being stopped. So we do have something that is definitely Earth directed, even though the coronagraphs really don't give us that impression. So I am actually very pleased with SWPSI and with uh, NASA for hanging in there and really working on, on getting this event modeled as well as they did. Now, we also had another eruption you see right here. This eruption occurred on the 6th. This this one is not going to be Earth directed, but it sure is telling you that as you move across this region here, you're getting a bit of a hot longitude. And so as we watch these new regions, especially 4169, 4172, and 4171, as they begin to cross through this area, you start seeing that they're getting busy as well. So it looks like we might be entering yet another Rosby surge. We had this set of regions really growing as it rotated into view. We had this filament lift off as it's kind of rotating through this hot area, and now these regions as well. So I would not be surprised if big solar flares continue to stay on the menu. These regions will likely still give us something as they begin to rotate off the disk, but these regions as well look like they could be the next to give us some big solar flares. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, be sure to, you know, stay vigilant because radio blackouts are on the menu this week. And now switching to our solar storm prediction model, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as I set this model in motion, you're going to see with NOAA's version, they actually have most of that solar storm launching very much to the west of Earth. And I'm not sure after looking really closely at those uh, at those images and seeing where the material was going, I'm not sure most of the material is going to be completely westward. However, they do have an arm that kind of pivots down in here and is Earth directed. So as we follow that, it looks like the, they have this heading right about noon on the 8th. Uh, again, I think that might be a little bit of a conservative estimate. I've also already seen that we are getting these particles rising ahead that's showing that we do have a shock that's on its way. So this may actually arrive a little bit earlier than anticipated. Now, as we switch to our NOAA or NASA's version of the model, again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. I think their model is a little bit better in terms of the, where the main bulk of the material is going to be. Again, they have it kind of hitting as a, as a glancing blow, but as we switch to the impact footprint, you can actually see that we've, Earth is definitely going to be impacted by this, and I think that's a pretty good indication there. Once again, though, they have the, the uh, storm hitting about uh, noon on the 8th. This is UTC time. So again, I think that there's a chance that the storm is actually going to arrive a little bit earlier. So Aurora photographers, start getting ready on this seventh because it could hit late on the seventh or obviously as late as about noon on the eighth. And then we also have that fast solar wind. You can see this little spiral arm of fast solar wind kind of hitting in and around the same time. And that's going to likely enhance this storm and give us a decent chance for Aurora to even reach mid-latitudes. 
And now switching to our moon, we are now passing through the full moon phase and we're on our way to a third quarter. And by the 12th, the moon will still be about 88% illuminated. So Unite Sky Watchers, if you want to catch some dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora from this storm, well, you're going to have this bright companion. But remember, we also have the Perseid meteor shower that's also beginning to pick up. So who knows, if you time it right with the moon rising and setting, you might actually catch some gorgeous shots of Perseids and the aurora. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating not just that Earth-directed solar storm, but also the fast solar wind. So that's going to give us several days of storming. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting up to a major storm. In fact, about a 60 to 70 percent chance of hitting a major storm over the 8th and in the 9th. Remember, we might get a little bit of it ahead of that. So be ready by the 7th, aurora photographers. And then by the 10th, we're probably going to be seeing some fast solar wind and then things will be calming down after that. So you have a definitely a few days to really catch some gorgeous aurora before things calm down. And now at mid-latitudes, well, we're only expecting minor storm conditions somewhere around the 8th and end of the 9th, but we do have about a 10% chance of a major storm. If it ends up impacting earlier, if it like hits late on the 7th, then of course those chances go up. So aurora photographers, I would get ready on the 7th and into the 8th, especially for this solar storm to arrive because it could be big enough to give us some decent aurora down at mid-latitudes before things begin to calm down over the weekend. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the mid triple digits for solar flux right now. And that is because we have so many big flare players in the earth facing or on the earth facing disc. We're sitting at also at moderate noise on the dayside radio bands. NOAA is giving us about a 55% chance of M class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and also about a 10% chance of X class flares at the R3 level radio blackout. And that's easily going to last over the next three days, possibly longer as this region begins to rotate. This is region 41 or 4165 and 4168 as those regions rotate to the sun's far side. But I'm not going to drop things down too much because we do have those new regions and they are showing a little bit of complexity and growth. So we could still keep those big radio blackouts on the menu into next week. And now switching to our polar radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. We are sitting in the green when it comes to radiation storms. We're sitting at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. And although we do have a risk for uh, R3 level radio blackouts, as of right now, it doesn't look like we have a big risk for radiation storms. We're only sitting at about a 5% chance of radiation storms. I'm pumping that up to about 10% as those regions that we were talking about begin to move to the west limb. That always makes that risk a bit higher. So you aviators, and this does include flight crew and you high-risk passengers, you're all in the green right now, but pay, pay attention to those ICAO advisories or your specialty advisories that let you know about those radio blackouts because it could be issues for comms, but it looks at least for radi radiation storms. You're all in the clear. So the space weather this week has picked up in a big way. We have that Earth-directed solar storm that should be hitting us eh, probably around the 8th, but you know, it might hit a little bit early. So aurora photographers start getting ready around the 7th and then into the 8th and possibly through the 9th and the 10th before things calm down, especially if you're at high latitudes. But you mid-latitude aurora photographers, you might want to be taking a look too. And now amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, big radio blackouts are back and they're going to continue to be like that easily over the next few days, probably into next week as well, because those new regions look like they're going to pick up where regions 4165 and 4168 left off. So you're just going to have to hunker down and deal with it. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we got radio blackouts on the day side and a lot of noise on the bands. And then on the night side, we're going to have this decent solar storm. So GPS reception might take a little bit of a tumble this week. So stay vigilant. And if you're flying anywhere near Aurora, or anywhere near those dawn dust terminators, be sure to calibrate your magnetometer often and stay tuned. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.